Well, this is the 11th of the 12 presentations on the structure and properties of organic molecules. And we're midway through seeing stereochemistry. We looked at first just looking at a structure to determine if it's chiral or not. But we want to now transition to designating its chirality. So we can establish that a structure is chiral, but can we designate its chirality? We use that usually through a kahn engel prelog notation, R or S, for those centers, those asymmetric carbons that cause chirality. So for penicillin here, we know that this is an asymmetric carbon here, here, and here. So we have three carbons that we could designate as having an R or S um, notation that captures its chirality. Before we do that, I do want to move to just one view of a structure you can consider that is Fisher projections, which has a code to it. It really comes out of the biological world. Um, it was used for sugars, showing sugars in their not only regiochemistry, but stereochemistry. And we talked about that's very important to knowing not only structure well, but also understanding reactions. We need to know the regio and stereochemistry of a reaction. In the biological world, the Fisher projection sort of uh, illustrated very quickly both the constitution or regiochemistry and the stereochemistry of a molecule. Let me show you an example of what I mean. So we have in the past videos considered, for example, Lewis-like structure or skeletal structure, sorry, wherein we show three dimensions using wedge, which means it's coming out towards us, and dash means this bromine's going back into the plane of the paper. And we have our zigzag conformation of the carbons. This can be quickly, um, I guess, shown with three dimensions using what is known as a Fisher projection. But to set this up, I need to change the orientation of the carbons to each other. In Fisher projections, we don't use a zigzag orientation of the alkyl groups. We usually have a line of them, and it's such that these are bending towards the back, towards each other. So I'm going to turn this, and you can do this with a kit turn this to the 180 degree orientation from where it is now. So this is going to be not up, but straight down. This won't be back and down, it'll be up and out. It'll be across from that bromine. So again, what I'm doing is rotating 180 degree rotation. I'm taking just one end and I'm going to rotate so that this is in the plane but down and this bromine which is down and in the plane of the paper will be up and out of the plane of the paper. This is setting up what we need to have as far as our alkyl groups. Our alkyl groups need to be in a line but I guess in a sense uh, across from each other. They, we kind of look at a Fisher projection as as having an eye towards the line of the back of the chain of carbons, the backbone, and that is going away from our eye. And anything off of those that chain of carbons is coming towards our eye, either to the left or to the right. So this is really setting up our Fisher projection, this eye here. We're looking at the bromines. We had the rest of our head in here. These bromines will be on the left side of our eye as we're looking at this and the alkyl group will be to the top and bottom so what we do with Fisher projections is we simply use just everything in the plane all the lines are not the lines are not shown with wedges and dashes so I'm going to go ahead and just show them as they are and then talk about them and the other side of the bromines there's hydrogens you say, well, what happened to the wedges and dashes? Well, in Fisher projections, you don't show it, but the code needs to be broken. You need to know that these are not all in the plane. The methyl group, that's to the top of my eye. The bromine and the bromine are to the left and coming out. You just need to know the code, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. And then the carbon here is towards the back. We know that. So these can't all be in the plane, these atoms. 
But the Fisher projection just has a code to it that is understood. When you look at a Fisher projection, those bonds that are on the vertical axis are going towards the back. Those that are on the horizontal are going to the wedge. So on the horizontal, they're wedge. Again, that's just part of the code. And the vertical, they're dash going to the back. This is what we really should think of. It's like a roly-poly in Texas, maybe. You bend, you bend it backward and its feet are all pointing towards you and you've rolled his head towards his tail and his legs are all sticking out. That's sort of the code behind the Fisher projection. And I just like to tell students, this is the way I break it. My mother-in-law loves our children. She bends over backwards. That's the vertical. That's the backbone for my grandchildren. And she loves to give them, give them hugs. So her arms are always out, the bromine and the hydrogen, the bromine and the hydrogen. So that's the way we can go from Fisher projection back to a skeletal structure if we needed to. We could draw it by just having wedge and dash, wedge and wedge here, wedge and wedge here, dash and dash here, or just lay it on its side. That's one way. Or we can move from skeletal structure to Fisher projection. Make sure you have the alkyl chain, the backbone, across from each other and heading to the back. All right, what is the relationship or relation between these two Fisher projections? Now remember, these would be on the wedge and these would be on the dash and we can put that information in there and we should be able to do that. We should. It's a good skill. We can do the same thing here. Again, grandma bends over backwards and she puts her arms out. There's a trick though, if you only have one chirality center, there's a trick you can use to try and to determine quickly the relationship between these two compounds that are drawn. Switching any two groups, if, this is, if, this, if these structures we're talking about have only one chirality center, switching any two groups off that chiral center if we can then superimpose it on this one, that indicates that they have an enantiomeric relationship if you switch once. If you have to switch twice to make them look exactly alike, it means that they're the same compound. Again, this can only be done if there's only one chirality sw center. Switch, then switching any two groups around the chirality center results in the enantiomer. So if we do that, we notice the chlorine and the bromine is the only thing that has to be switched. If I switch these two groups, I can superimpose this structure on this one. But again, I'm breaking bonds here, so I'm saying, hey, if I just were to break bonds, switch the chlorine out for the bromine and the bromine out for the chlorine, I could make these look alike. But I did that once. I switched two groups once. These have to be then enantiomers. They are different to start off. By starting off, I had to switch two groups once to make them superimposable. They are enantiomers. Again, you can only do that with structures that have one chirality center. Let's transition for the last 10 to 15 minutes of our time. Let's transition to designating chirality centers. Now, I'm not going to give much time to designating chirality through its optical activity. Dextrorotatory, levorotatory rotation of polarized light. Light that's, um, I guess, uh, brought in to a sample that's chiral. If a chiral sample is isolated in gas or liquid form and it's um, pol is exposed to polarized light, that means just light having its electromagnetic wave defined in one plane, we can have an interaction between the sample, the chiral sample, and the polarized light. This is called optical activity. If it bends the, the light in a counterclockwise Rot uh, rotation, then it's levorotatory. If it's clockwise rotation of that polarized light, it's dextrorotatory. There's no way you can take the sample and say, I know it's going to be one or the other. There's just nothing about the sample you can assess before you make some comments about its property, its optical activity. You just have to analyze it. But you know this, that the enantiomer, the enantiomer of that chiral molecule would have the same rotation in the opposite direction and to the same degree. So if it bent light one way, levorotatory, to say 10 degrees, the same amount of sample of the enantiomer would bend the light 10 degrees in the opposite direction. 
So let's just remember some things that we, as, that we need to know for optical activity. Chiral molecules are optically active. Enantiomers bend light in opposite directions to the same degree. The signs, plus and minus, are used to designate optical activity. Just know these terms as dextrorotatory, dextro levorotatory, clockwise, counterclockwise. And rotation of the light depends not only upon the inherent nature of the molecule, but also the number of them, the concentration. All right, last topic, and this one's the hardest. Designating R and S are absolute configuration for molecules, the kahn engel prelog system of notation. So let's take minus glyceraldehyde, and this is, a, again, a bending of the light in a levorotatory manner. It was known that some molecules that were chiral could be separated from each other. Now, they didn't know, even though they knew that one was minus, one was plus, they didn't know the absolute configuration of groups off the asymmetric carbons. They even knew that they had asymmetric carbons. And they knew this is the source of chirality, but they didn't know orientation of groups specifically off of that carbon. So X-ray crystallography was instrumental in providing a view of what this thing looks like in all its detail, where things are bonded and how they're oriented. So that changed the picture of minus glyceraldehyde so that we could start putting with the minus an S or an R. So this structure became elucidated through X-ray crystallography as having an S absolute configuration. Now, how can we add this information to the name of the molecule? How do we know the rules for doing that? Well, let's learn those. So we now know with structures from X-ray crystallography, it's absolute configuration. We just need to designate that now. Well, to do that, we have to start with um, some simple rules for designating absolute configuration. First, determine group priority, one, two, three, and four, off of this carbon. So we have to do that with these four groups determine their priority. So priority setting that is the key for those four groups. Now we can do that here, but if we <clears throat> move to the next step, second step, we have to know the orientations. Look at this statement, number two. This is again to set R and S. With the tip of your thumb on the group of least priority, sweep your fingers in the same circular mo motion sorry, that you have going in order from groups one to group three. So the thumb now has to be oriented to where the lowest priority group is. Now just to start, I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's the hydrogen, but notice if I knew it was the hydrogen, but I was over here before x-ray crystallography, I wouldn't know which way to point my thumb. You say, well, point it straight down. Well, no, we know these four are not in the same plane. This is sp3. So I would not know how to apply, I guess, step two in setting R and S. So again, we had to know the structure, absolute structure. So let's look at priority. How do we set priority? Well, the first thing we have to do is look out bonds to see weight of atoms. So we were joking in class that we have a schooner, the mothership, and it's sitting right here at this carbon that is an asymmetric center. And we look out the bonds, and we would see an O, a carbon, a telescope, you know, an H, and a carbon. So right now, looking out, we'd see two that are the same and two that are different from these two carbons. And we could set priority right now to four, because that's the lowest nuclei that I see through the telescope looking out the schooner. I see its nuclei. It's smallest in size. I see the nuclei here. It's largest in size. And I see two that are equal. Well, then we take our dinghy, the Fish, fishing little little fishing vessels and we go out to those two carbons and we would report back what we observe standing or sitting on the sea at these two points. And we would report back this observes an O, an O, an H. You report twice for every bond, or for report once for each bond, so sigma and pi, an O, O, H. And this is how we really tag it. O, O, H is what he observes. This dinghy Reporting back to the mothership, what it's observing, would report, I see an O, there's sigma bond to that O, I see two H's, we'll set, put them in priority. And we report, hey, it doesn't look like this is going to be the winner, it's not going to be the highest priority. When you play this game in a one-on-one -on -one fashion, not my best three to your best three, dingy to dingy, one-on-one, -on -one. so O versus O, first round, tie. 
Second round, the O that's reported back from this carbon, it beats the H that's reported back from this carbon. So this whole branch becomes number three, and this branch one, it becomes number two. Now again, it's not higher than the O that you originally observed. So that's how we set priority. So for glyceraldehyde, we can do that for S and for R, but now we know where to point our thumb. We would point it towards four, and we would take our left hand, rolling from one to two to three, one to two to three. My left hand would capture the rotation, the left hand from one to two to three, thumb out, because four is out. My right hand, if I put my thumb out, why? Because four is out. My right hand will not capture that. So it's not an R configuration, it's an S. Now, of course, you can try this with R plus glyceraldehyde, and I hope you will see that your left hand will no longer work. My left hand would no longer work because I'm rolling 1 to 3 to 2. So that's just an idea of how to use the hand approach. We have to set priority. We do that by looking and floating out, looking out with our telescope or floating out with our dinghies and step or stepping out and then once we've set priority using those steps we look at the hand rule or what we're going to see is a steering wheel approach can also be used once you've set the priorities again here's another structure on the bottom right showing priority that could have been determined just by looking out from this carbon bromine's number one it's the biggest nuclei chlorine's number two it's the next biggest nuclei and then fluorine and then hydrogen so in this case, the thumb would be pointed straight up because that's where the hydrogen is. You wrap your palm around the carbon. That's the asymmetric center. And you roll your fingers one to two to three. Well, that would take from one to two to three my right hand. I can't do it with my left hand. My left hand would roll three to two to one. So this would be an R configuration. So again, I, I like the hand approach, but it's, there's going to be one other way to do this. Again, we used for glyceraldehyde, the S, the minus glyceraldehyde, we used the left hand to wrap that up. Do fingers sweep in the direction from one to, to three. You don't have to start at uh, one, but you just have to be going in the right direction. So this is going in that direction here that this arrow is designating. We're going in a clockwise direction, and that can be captured if our thumb is out. Thumb is the orientation point. It's kind of like when you're hitchhiking. You don't put your thumb down. You hitchhike going my way. The thumb has to be oriented in the right direction. So we orient out because the H is out. It was number four. And we roll one to two to three. Oh, that's captured by the left hand. Now there's one other way to do this, and we'll stop with this. It's called the steering wheel approach. I like it if it's uh, with the H's to the back. It's very easy. <coughs> if H is to the back, that's going to be your steering column. It's the lowest priority group. And you clockwise turns, clockwise turns are, are and this is a very important if, if LP is back. If LP is back, clockwise is R, and counterclockwise with rotation of 1 to 2 to 3, would be S. LP to the back, clockwise is R. It's a good approach to use with molecules. Some folks don't like the hand approach. So let's go ahead and look at lactic acid, R minus a lactic acid. I've already set the priorities. O is the first thing we see that's biggest. These two are the same, but once you dinghy out, it has two oxygens. This only has three hydrogens, so it's two. This is three, and of course this is four. Now, lowest priority is in the plane. It's in the plane. How do we deal with that? Well, you can still kind of imagine your steering column here, and you can see that this is going from top to right, so we're making a clockwise turn. You're just kind of looking at it from the side. We could say LP to the back clockwise. This would be R. I um, guess it's much easier if, of course, this is shown to the back, if we have I'm just going to put in here one, two, three. If it's to the back, 
and this was wedge, we could more easily say, oh, it's easily seen as clockwise. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, H is on the dash, one, two, three, H is on the dash, that means LP is to the back. Clockwise is R. Now, the one thing I do like about this approach, if we were to switch this, one, two, put three to the back, whatever three is, and have four to the front, we could say one, two, three, one, two, three, we still have clock, clockwise rotation, but four is to the front. We can't use this rule then, because four, lowest priority group, has to be to the, to the back if clockwise is R. But you can just flip the rule. One, two, three, one, two, three, clockwise is R if this is to the back. Well, if it's to the front, it's just, it's just S. You could flip the rule. There are other ways to approach it. You could switch the two groups. But you can just say, one, two, three, one, two, three is clockwise. LP is to the front. That's S. If LP is to the back, clockwise is R. A lot of ways to go at this. Setting priority is probably the hardest thing to do when you're looking at structures. And maybe the hand approach doesn't work for you, but either the hand approach or the steering wheel approach, you need to practice applying one of those two methods for setting the Kahn Engel prelog system of notation for asymmetric carbons, R or S. Bye bye.